you know, but um, that was the big change. It would be like if Mao discovered, you know, cold fusion, you know, in 1968 or something like that, and China had endless power, you know, we'd all be Maoists today because we'd say, you know, that, that system works really well. But of course, um, he didn't, and, um, and his reforms petered out, and that was the end of it. Uh, and that is important because uh, what you're seeing in, in Islam now, or in the Muslim world now, is a certain degree of conflict from an ideology that does not explain the standard of living that Muslims have today, trying to impose itself as a solution to improving their lives for the future. It is destined to fail because it won't uh, produce a better life for these people. It may take a hundred years for this, this intellectual societal experiment to play itself out. But there's no doubt that something which is which you know doesn't offer solutions to you know um, health care, to uh, uh, you know nutrition, to clean drinking water, etc., um, uh, is unlikely to be the dominant ideology for the 1.2 billion Muslims a century from now. What it does have going for it, which is very important, is in the vast majority of Muslim countries, there's complete inequality, and and there isn't much democracy. And so a system that appears to uh, say we are all equal and, um, uh, and the rule of law will be paramount is enormously attractive. But those aspects of what, you know, um, uh, sort of, the, you know, what is embedded in, in perhaps certain types of Islam that you would associate with the Saudi royal family, those elements of it um, can be stripped away from it and used in many other contexts. You don't need to also say that, you know, we have to go back to living like we did a thousand years ago for us to all be equal and for us to have the rule of law. Um, and I think uh, the, the danger will come when we see uh, secular attempts to do this, like in Pakistan, the fact that there's mass support for the judiciary uh, in Pakistan. People want the uh, judges to function without political intervention. If we then go and have a military coup and crush that movement and stuff the system with totally you know, corrupt judges and politically influenced judges, yes, you are making people more um, uh, attracted to perhaps a religious approach at getting at the same solution. But that's not the only solution. So um, I've talked about a few different things there, but, uh, but hopefully that, that captures some of the themes that you raised. Uh, many, um, thanks for coming. Uh, many Americans are very critical <clears throat> of the Pakistanis because uh, President Musharraf granted a certain amount of autonomy <clears throat> to the tribal areas. And it just so happens that those tribal areas are supporting Taliban attacks uh, on uh, an independent country, maybe much smaller. <laughs> and uh, how can we possibly tolerate it? Um, how can the Pakistanis tolerate it? Is there a way to cooperate so that we can de uh, neutralize the issue, neutralize this, uh, these attacks? What, what should we do? Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is, is from a, just if you take as a starting point the notion of, you know, how can we tolerate it? Um, I think we must all ask ourselves the question, do we have the right not to tolerate it? So, for example, in the case of the conflict between, you know, Taliban and Pakistan and Afghanistan, um, America can assert that it is America's right to intervene in that conflict, but in truth, that is a Pakistani-Afghan conflict. And whether America has a right to tolerate or not tolerate that is something else. Now that said, it's true that um, the Taliban in Pakistan have a very destabilizing influence on Afghanistan. Um, and, uh, uh, and it should not be the case that people in any country can cross the border and attack people in any other country. The question is, how do we prevent this from happening? What is the solution to that? Uh, uh, you know, and in Afghanistan, um, there is, at the moment, a, I think, a deeply unstable situation. You know, you have um, a government with very little legitimacy in the southwest of the country, and the part of the, the southeast of the country, the part that the Pathan Belt, which borders Afghanistan. And you have, in Pakistan, tribes that don't really think of themselves as being in a separate country. So they move across the border, and some of them happen to live in Pakistan, and some happen to live in Afghanistan, but the border for them is really a fiction. And it has been that way forever. Nobody has ever imposed that border on these people. What needs to happen is both Pakistan and Afghanistan need to uh, engage with the people in the Afghani southeast and the Pakistan northwest 
um, slowly bring to them the benefits of government rule and of a functional state um, and work to marginalize those who want to kill people on either side of the border. Um, but, uh, uh, and it's not to say that you, 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 know, you, you have to put Pakistan's interests ahead of Afghanistan's interests. It's that the people we're talking about in the Southwest are also Afghans. You know, the Taliban and these people who are conducting these attacks are Afghans and Pakistanis. They're both. And sometimes they're, they are both at the same time. They're people where one brother was born on one side of the border and one brother on the other. So, um, you know, for me, what that means is uh, it'll be very difficult to have a stable uh, tribal area in Pakistan without stability in the Afghan side of the border and vice versa. Um, but, but treating this as a, a war between states, you know, that, for example, the way that you could say Pakistani guerrillas, you know, maybe crossing over and attacking India is, is one thing, um, or, you know, French partisans crossing over and attacking Germany is one thing. Actually, we have a people who are, who are kind of of both places, and we need to think jointly about a solution to, the, to those things. And the U.S., I think, um, actually complicates it. It complicates it because although it can support both Afghanistan and Pakistan, and has been doing so, and I think should continue to do so, the presence of, of, of uh, U.S. forces in those areas, um, the accidental killings associated with those forces being in those areas, and the, and the, uh, the violence in, in, in those places, um, creates an external threat that uh, really complicates what's already a complicated situation. And that's why I come back to think of how can we tolerate. Um, I would say for those of us in Cleveland now, it is not for us to decide do we tolerate or not tolerate. It is rather to say there are people who live there who must decide how to tolerate. How can we support them, both Afghans and Pakistanis, equally in dealing with that? But it's a longer answer. I think we're out of time, unfortunately. But perhaps afterwards we can talk more. Thank you. Thank you again. Today at the City Club of Cleveland Forum, we have been listening to Mohsen Hamid, Amosfield Wolf Book Award winning author of The Reluctant Fundamentalist. Thank you, Mr. Hamid. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.